welcome to our continuing 2021 educational webinar series. I am Katherine Short, Partnership Marketing Manager for First Healthcare Compliance. At First Healthcare Compliance, we help you with a comprehensive compliance management solution tailored to your business. A hospital, hospital network, healthcare practice of any size, billing company, or skilled nursing facility, and we help manage every aspect of a compliance program and our training library provides hundreds of modules that are easy to assign and track. As part of our complimentary educational webinar series, we bring you experts from around the country to discuss relevant topics in the healthcare industry. We are so pleased to have Jennifer Gimler Brady, partner at Potter Anderson and Caroon LLP. She concentrates her practice in the areas of labor and employment law, health law, and commercial litigation. As stated in the current edition of Chambers USA, clients note that she is very knowledgeable and able to cut through the issues. Jennifer counsels employers on labor and employment issues, inclu including workplace investigations, unionization and collective bargaining, employee supervision, discipline and discharge, sexual harassment, employment and employment discrimination. Jennifer also regularly advises long-term care providers, physician practices, and other health care providers on a variety of issues, including licensing and certification, fraud and abuse laws, medical privacy and confidentiality, and litigation matters. Jennifer is a frequent lecturer and author on a variety of employment and health care issues. Recent topics include how employers can navigate workplace challenges of the COVID-19 pandemic, implications of the U.S. Supreme Court's landmark Bostock decision for employers, and the role of boards in healthcare compliance. A longtime participant in the firm committees and management, Jennifer currently serves as the firm's general counsel. She is the former practice leader of the firm's general litigation group and a former member of the firm's executive committee. Before we begin, I would like to mention at First Healthcare Compliance, we strive to serve as a trusted resource for compliance professionals. And every month we celebrate their hard work and dedication with our Compliance Super Ninja recognition. For this Super Ninja, our team is turning the spotlight on Mary Ann Johnson, practice manager at Clinic by the Sea. Mary Ann says, cardiology is so interesting and the patients make it worth our while. The owner of our company, George Dar, MD, is a great cardiologist and I am impressed at how much compassion he has with his patients and staff. All our providers are great and it is a good feeling watching the patient interaction with my staff and our providers. Congratulations, Mary Ann. Our team is honored to have the privilege of working with you. A copy of the slides is available for download on the control panel. Feel free to submit questions into the question box on your control panel during the presentation. We'll address questions at the conclusion of the presentation. Your PACOM and PMI CEU certificates will be emailed to you following the broadcast. Your PACOM certificate will come directly from PACOM and your PMI certificate will come from our email. There is no need to request either one. Additional CEU opportunities will be available to BC Advantage members following the live broadcast. See their website for details. So Jennifer, it is a great pleasure to welcome you. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Catherine. It is a delight to be with you and your uh, listeners today. And I appreciate the opportunity to uh, speak about um, workplace safety issues as uh, uh, employers um, get ready to return to, uh, to the workplace. So we're going to get started. And um, the first thing I'd like to talk about is OSHA um, and the, the role of OSHA in workplace safety and uh, some recent guidance that OSHA has uh, um, put out regarding COVID uh, safety issues in the workplace. So just as brief background, um, OSHA is the Occupational Safety and Health Administration. Its focus is on uh, workplace safety. 
um, many of us think about OSHA when, um, or in relation to major construction projects or, or you know, more uh, often when there are significant injuries or a catastrophic event um, in, a, in a, uh, a large construction project or something like that. That may be how folks think of OSHA. Um, but OSHA also is, um, its role is broader and it the kinds of circumstances or, or safety considerations in the workplace that it may pay attention to are, are broader than just um, large heavy equipment kind of operations. The Occupational um, Safety and Health Act, uh, which um, uh, led to the creation of um, the administration, is um, premised upon an idea that in, the workplaces should be free from recognized hazards that are likely to cause death or serious physical harm. And so whether that is because of, of machinery that's present or a, a process um, that might have a manufacturing process that might have high risk or materials in the workplace, chemicals, um, toxic substances and how they're handled. Uh, so the idea is that all of those um, risks should be mitigated to the fullest extent possible uh, to, in order to protect the, the health and uh, safety and well-being of employees in the workplace. So in general, uh, OSHA imposes um, reporting and obligations um, on employers in certain circumstances recording obligations on employers in certain circumstances when they have recordable workplace uh, events, um, such as um, confirmed injuries or a death or a hospitalization. Uh, those are all significant events that have to be reported. Um, in the COVID uh, sphere, COVID infections and deaths are recordable if uh, there's a confirmed case, it's work-related, such as an exposure that has occurred at work, um, and other reporting criteria are present, uh, present, whether there's medical treatment, lost time from work, that type of thing. And as you can imagine, the, the, the trickier part of this uh, for reporting would be the exposure at work and whether you could really pinpoint that somebody had an exposure at work. In certain environments, it may be easier if you're in a healthcare environment um, where you're exposed to known cases and treating known cases of COVID. Um, it, it's likely less of a stretch to find, to make the connection with exposure at work than it might be in some other environments where it could have been at work, it could have been at the grocery store, it could have been at the family gathering um, that an employee was involved in. So um, uh, it's, a little, it's a little more nuanced um, in terms of OSHA reporting requirements. But that's the general framework of uh, OSHA and OSHA reporting. OSHA has uh, authority to inspect workplaces for compliance for possible safety violations. So they can show up at a workplace unannounced and um, uh, conduct a safety uh, survey. More often than not, it is in response to some type of employee or other concerned citizen complaint to OSHA about a potential safety uh, risk or violation at um, the, the workplace. And in the, the COVID world, um, uh, you may uh, have heard really early on in the pandemic, OSHA was criticized pretty heavily for not being more assertive and more aggressive about ensuring that workers who were continuing to come to work every day because of the essential nature of their, their work, food processing, health care, uh, some other uh, essential environments, that um, there was a concern that OSHA wasn't being uh, aggressive enough to ensure that those employees who had to come to the workplace were protected and that employers were providing adequate personal protective equipment, were enforcing 
um, uh, distancing. We're re uh, enforcing good sanitization and um, uh, hygiene, hand washing uh, requirements. We're um, uh, enforcing mask wearing um, in the environment. And uh, so over time, I think we saw really more stepped up activity by OSHA and uh, an increasing a number of inspections and an increasing number of fines and penalties being issued. OSHA has enforcement authority. Um, it, 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 depending on the nature of the situation, its approach may be more educational um, and helping the, in giving the employer guidance on uh, best practices where you have an employer who made attempts to uh, mitigate safety risks, but maybe they weren't as uh, robust as they should have been. And so in that case, where an employee, an employer is um, exercising good faith efforts to uh, protect employees, but maybe um, uh, not as um, uh, aggressively as, as uh, would be recommended, OSHA may have uh, a more of a supportive approach. But in workplaces where um, there are deficits or maybe not even a good faith effort to try to mitigate uh, potential harms. Those are situations where um, we're more likely to see imposition of, of penalties. Um, as of about mid-January of this year, uh, OSHA has inspected more than 300 workplaces uh, with regard to looking for COVID-19 related uh, violations and has issued fines in excess of $4 million at this point relating to lapses in um, COVID safety. Um, on OSHA's website, uh, which is OSHA.gov, you can find information about uh, penalties about businesses that have been inspected and have been found uh, deficient and on which um, OSHA has enforced remedies. And they're listed by the, by the business and, and there's some other uh, information present, but also including the amount of the penalty. In general, um, the COVID related penalties have ranged from say 10,000 to, to 30,000, which depending upon the nature of the business, the revenues, whether that's a thin margin business, some may view those penalties as not uh, terribly significant, where other business might, businesses might view them as, as uh, really impactful. But the fact that the information is publicly available, that an employer has been found to be deficient in this area, um, it, it's more than just the amount of the penalty that, that can be consequential to the employer. Um, if, for example, you're in a uh, healthcare environment and taking care of patients and there's a bad patient outcome, um, it's not much of a stretch for uh, a plaintiff lawyer to also want to look at the compliance history of the employer um, to uh, potentially make out a claim that say, the employer um, was lax with regard to, to safety and um, protecting the well-being both of its employees and its customers, its patients, et cetera. So there are some other consequences to, to um, uh, being fined or being penalized that are beyond just the amount. Uh, if you look at the uh, COVID-related surveys, probably not surprisingly, long-term care facilities are, are disproportionately represented. And I, I say that um, uh, simply because of um, the uh, fact that long-term care facilities uh, really have been uh, hit very hard um, with uh, COVID, both from resident infections and staff infections, uh, particularly in the early days of the pandemic. Um, and there were allegations that um, facilities did not have adequate PPE, uh, were not taking adequate precautions to separate COVID positive residents from the rest of the residents and staff. Um, and again, it, in particular at the outset of the pandemic. So again, it's not surprising that, that uh, long-term care facilities and other healthcare uh, organizations have been, or are perhaps disproportionately represented 
on the uh, fines and uh, penalties list. Um, the kinds of things that OSHA has cited employers for uh, doing or not doing include um, uh, not implementing a written respiratory protection program, providing written guidance to employees about how to protect themselves from airborne pathogens, um, providing a medical evaluation or a respirator, uh, respirator fit test um, that is um, the, the um, uh, having certain PPE is great, but not if it's not appropriately fitted to the user. And so um, certain types of uh, respirators need to be, um, uh, they, they need to have, ensure that they are fit appropriately to the, to the individual using them. So it's not just, wow, we've got these great respirators, but if they're not um, uh, individualized, they can be worthless essentially as a, a protection uh, device. So fit testing is, is an important uh, part with, when dealing with uh, respiratory illness. Um, training on the proper use of equipment, prote personal protective equipment, and use of a respirator, how to in inform employees to, to maximize their, their safety with the equipment that's available. Um, failing to report an injury, illness, or fatality, again, early on um, in the pandemic. Um, uh, candidly, there wasn't um, necessarily clarity that reporting a COVID-related death of a, of a staff member or an employee was um, an OSHA issue, um, but that clarity um, uh, came as the months went on. Um, or uh, failing to properly record an, in, uh, an injury or illness, again, uh, COVID-related, and a failure to comply with the general duty clause, which is the obligation to provide a safe um, uh, workplace environment. So in January of this year, at the end of January, actually, OSHA provided uh, additional guidance on COVID safety um, in the workplace. It applies to all industries other than healthcare um, because healthcare is subject to its own uh, more specific guidance applicable to healthcare organizations. It is not mandatory. It's in the form of a guidance. It's more like a, a recommended best practices type of um, uh, guidance. There are no regulations yet. They are anticipated, um, but it does provide employers with some uh, helpful uh, guidance on how to um, have a safe workplace um, in the face of COVID-19. Frankly, um, you know, some employers may have viewed this as a little late to the table uh, because many of their the recommendations in the guidance are um, uh, kind of common sense at this at this point, and things that many employers um, who've had employees in the workplace have already been doing. But some of it is um, uh, useful. Uh, in particular, some of the suggestions include establishing a workplace coordinator for COVID-19. Um, this is a, a little variation on other recommendations that uh, some employers have adopted safety committees, COVID safety committees, that are comprised of employees that are all throughout the organization, so uh, that are representative of all of the the key areas of the organization or the departments of the organization. So you have a representative with a viewpoint from every um, operational function of the employer to talk about or bring the perspective of how COVID related issues are impacting that department or are translated within that department. Also to per perhaps surface up any particularized risk areas it may not be applicable to the employer as a whole or the employer's operations as a whole, but are particularly um, uh, of concern in a, in a department. So having a, a, a organization-wide uh, COVID safety committee is an approach that some employers have used. OSHA suggests 
as I said, a variation on this with having a workplace coordinator. So just essentially somebody who's charged with responsibility for the employer's COVID compliance and, and COVID safety efforts. Uh, some other suggestions are uh, making available no cost vaccinations to employees. We're gonna talk a little bit uh, uh, further along here about uh, vaccination programs and, and mandatory vaccines uh, for employees, but the OSHA's point is encouraging employees to get vaccinated by making vaccinations available to employees at no cost. Enforcing masks and other protective measures, even for vaccinated employees, and this is because it's still not known yet whether vaccinated employees can still get sick or are capable of transmitting the uh, virus, even if they're not um, experiencing symptoms themselves. Physical distancing or barriers where distancing is impossible, general cleaning measures, and quarantine and isolation periods. And as I said, many employers kind of view this as OSHA being a little late to the table because they have been doing these kinds of safety measures um, since the pandemic began. So switching gears a little bit and talking about vaccines and, and where we stand and some of the issues that are impacting employers or that employers need to think about with regard to vaccines um, will be our, our next subject. Um, just a thumbprint, I'm based here in Delaware. So um, I, every state has a different um, place, if you will, on where they are in their vaccine efforts. Um, and each state is handling it a little bit differently. Um, uh, although I think uniformly the, uh, the states were prioritizing healthcare personnel, frontline medical uh, uh, services, um, and long term care facilities and their staff, um, residents and staff. And those, those vaccinations are largely completed for those who want them. Um, and um, many states are in what in Delaware is uh, R1B, which is folks older than 65 or 65 and older, um, uh, other frontline essential workers, teachers um, uh, are also uh, being prioritized in this group and other essential workers. And, and the hope is that eventually we'll be, um, uh, later this month, we'll be uh, moving on with um, people with high risk medical conditions uh, people living in congregate housing, correctional facilities, um, and then, you know, as the, our, our president has um, recently announced, the hope is that by the end of May, really any adult who wants to be vaccinated will be able to get a vaccine. And again, every state is a little bit different um, and in terms of their timing and, and priorities at this point, but again, the, the hope is that um, uh, anybody who will want a vaccine by the summer will have the opportunity to get one. How that's being administered, um, it, as we know, many states have offered mass vaccination locations where um, they can um, distribute vaccines to as many people as, as possible in a controlled way. Healthcare providers, uh, several of them were doing on site clinics to cover everybody in their hospital or in their long term care facility. But as we get to the broader distribution of vaccines, we're seeing more opportunities perhaps for employers to play a role in the distribution system. And states may ask employers to facilitate vaccines on site or consider providing a vaccine voucher program to employees where some of the vaccine partners, um, which are uh, pharmacies and other distribution points will affiliate with particular employers. And so their employees can go to XYZ pharmacy or you know, this clinic or that clinic to get their vaccines if they're not being provided at the workplace. And I, I've given the contact information for Delaware's um, vaccine planning um, sites to the extent anybody is interested in that. So a lot of employers right now are grappling with the impact of vaccine availability 
on their return to work plans. Um, as we mentioned, several employer, uh, employers are not dealing with return to work plans because they never left or they uh, all, uh, had um, you know, reduced staff, but people have been on site continuously. Um, but a lot of operations are considering now uh, that vaccines are becoming more widely available, uh, whether to start returning their employees to the workplace and how, how to make that happen. And part of that is um, what's the role of, of vaccines in, in that programming and that plan. There are uh, questions about whether or not employers can uh, make among their employees. Um, EEOC has said in other contexts, and more specifically the flu vaccine, that it is possible for employers to mandate that employees get vac vaccinated, provided that they offer the opportunity or offer exemptions for medical reasons where it's a, there's a medical contraindication to vaccination. Perhaps you have an employee who's had previous adverse reactions to vaccines or has a medical condition that um, otherwise would warrant not getting vaccinated, or the employee has a bona fide religious uh, belief um, that is counter to or prohibits the employee from receiving uh, a vaccine. And we're going to talk about accommodation issues a little further in the presentation, but essentially um, it, the, the point that um, I wanted to make here is that is as a general proposition, employers can mandate that employees get vaccinated subject to a medical or, or religious exemption. And we'll, we'll talk about another caveat shortly, but the pros of doing a mandatory um, vaccine would be obviously protecting employee health. Or if you are in a, uh, a setting where a custodial setting or a, a caregiving setting, um, you protecting others from being uh, from getting the illness and protecting the community. Those are all um, very positive outcomes of a mandatory vaccine policy, not to mention reducing absenteeism, increasing productivity by fewer employees getting sick or needing to take time off um, or potentially to isolate or um, to be in quarantine. Uh, those are all things that could be very positive uh, outgrowths of uh, mandatory vaccines. The cons, the negative impact on morale is, is huge uh, because you could have um, some employees who are afraid of the vaccine, who are concerned about the vaccine, who are worried about the safety of the vaccine and the speed with which it came to market. Um, as in addition to, you know, other uh, perhaps less mainstream arguments against it, um, which, you know, are, are individualized. But you may have employees who are genuinely concerned about, uh, about the safety or frankly just don't like to be told um, that they have to do something or that they just have a view of vaccines generally that is inconsistent with a mandate. It also, because of the caveats, the exceptions of medical and religious based uh, exceptions to a mandatory pol uh, policy, it puts the employer in the position of having to potentially have some awkward discussions, either about somebody's medical conditions. Um, that, but for a mandatory policy, vaccine policy, the employer wouldn't have had to engage in, wouldn't have acquired that knowledge about the employee's uh, medical status. The same about their religious beliefs, that um, putting employees in the position of hearing, um, of having to share their religious uh, tenets and religious beliefs, that's information that employers can't unhear, or as I say, an, a bell that can't be unrung. And one can easily you know, foresee a situation 
outside of the pandemic world, but just a, a regular, you know, perhaps a disciplinary action or some other performance related action where down the road, the employee says, this isn't because I'm a poor performer. This is because you now know that I have this medical condition or that you're discriminating against me because you know of uh, this information about my religious beliefs. So it does put the employer in a position of knowing information that they wouldn't otherwise have had a reason to know potentially. There is the potential for litigation. Um, there are some protections um, available, um, vaccine injuries. Um, this is a, uh, the COVID vaccines are deemed a covered countermeasure under some federal laws that uh, deal with vaccine related injuries. And arguably the employees that they have an adverse reaction to a vaccination would be relegated to those um, funds for the, um, the um, vaccine related injuries, but there could be other related litigation. Um, there could be uh, some type of, of discriminatory uh, treatment litigation or some type of adverse impact litigation, uh, depending on how the vaccinations are treated and any kind of um, uh, adverse decision making uh, against particular employees. It's just a, a possible risk or a, it, it, it opens the door to potential argument. You could have staff reductions if employees decide to vote with their feet rather than um, getting, being forced to comply with a, a vaccination. They could just say, I'm not, I don't want to work here any longer. And in certain businesses, uh, you know, particularly in healthcare, um, uh, staff reductions are not, uh, would, would be a very undesirable outcome. Um, and then there are the EUA implications, and that's a reference to emergency use, use authorization. The vaccines are currently approved by the FDA pursuant to emergency use authorizations, um, meaning they don't yet have full unqualified FDA approval. And there is language in the statute underlying the EUA process that indicates that recipients of uh, the approved, whether it's a medical device or here vaccines, have must be given the right to decline, must have the option to decline the, um, the vaccination. They also must be informed of the consequences of, of doing that, of declining, and whether other alternatives are available. And that is a classic informed consent rubric. There's nothing in the statute that indicates you can't penalize somebody for declining. Um, and so it, that's been read to suggest that there's nothing in the EUA process that prohibits a mandatory vaccination just because it's an EUA um, uh, vaccine. However, caution would warrant that uh, employers think through that potential challenge that a mandatory policy is inconsistent with the EUA right to decline to receive the vaccine. Um, that issue will likely resolve itself once the FDA gives full approval to the vaccines, which could be in the relatively short term, but it's something that should be considered. So the potential liability, we talked about um, uh, potential uh, failure to accommodate claims if for some reason uh, a religious or disability-based uh, exemption request is denied and or found not to be meritorious. Um, there are potential workers' compensation claims for an adverse reaction. The standard's not very high for um, uh, a uh, vaccine program even a voluntary one that's encouraged by the employer or facilitated by the employer, but still is, is quote, voluntary, could be a compensable uh, situation for purposes of workers' compensation if an employee is injured by the vaccine and requires time off for medical treatment or has some other adverse reaction. Um, also, 
um, with regard to on-site vaccinations. Employers just need to be mindful of potential ERISA and HIPAA implications as to whether on the ERISA side, providing medical care uh, that the vaccine uh, program would, would be deemed compli uh, providing medical care, subjecting um, the employer to a potential um, group health plan uh, idea that's subject to HIP, uh, to ERISA. And then, of course, there are HIPAA um, issues, uh, potentially, um, where HIPAA has said on-site medical um, clinics can cover COVID testing without losing status as a HIPAA-accepted benefit, meaning it's not um, on-site um, COVID diagnostic testing is not considered to be subject to HIPAA requirements, but it's unclear at this point whether that would also extend to uh, COVID vaccines. And then, of course, I had mentioned earlier about the protections under the PREP Act, uh, the Public Readiness and Emergency Preparedness Act, which provides employers potentially some protection or immunity as program planners um, who are facilitating the administration of a covered countermeasure. So there, there are just some liability considerations that employers want to be aware of. Um, so what are some of the alternatives uh, to mandatory programs? Education, informing employees about vaccine benefits and safety, and, and encouraging uh, employees to get vaccinated voluntarily. Um, can employers offer incentives? Yes. They can to encourage employees to get vaccinated. Maybe small value uh, items could be considered. Um, water bottles, uh, maybe branded with the company logo or gift cards of a modest value. Um, that is guidance um, consistent with um, proposed rules um, uh, put out by the EEOC on wellness programs. Um, I should note, though, that business groups have asked the EEOC to relax that guidance and essentially bless providing more um, uh, significant incentives in order to give uh, employers maximum optionality to encourage employees to get vaccinated. Um, I can tell you that um, am, I am aware of employers who have given um, paid time off to employees to get vaccinated so that they're not experiencing lost time if they take a couple of hours off to go to a vaccine clinic um, that's being operated during the workday. Um, employers have considered giving additional paid time off as a reward for um, getting a vaccine or have just considered cash payments um, of you know, a few hundred dollars. Um, the, the risk there is, though, for employees, the, the kind of adverse impact or disparate impact on employees who either can't get a vaccine because of a medical or religious-based um, uh, exception or who don't want to get one and aren't getting access to the incentives. You could see how that could be viewed as having a disparate impact perhaps on the, on the basis of disability or religion because of those folks who just as a categorically can't it qualify for the incentive because they can't get the vaccine. So employers should think through uh, those issues and that's why a, a relatively modest value um, incentive is, is recommended, is the recommended approach, but um, employers have to make those decisions based on uh, their own individual uh, circumstances. Um, if you're going to go down the mandatory road, you're certainly going to, going to want to be able to articulate why you're doing that. And for some businesses, it's going to be maybe more of a no-brainer um, than uh, it, for others. If you're working in a public-facing, hands-on caregiving role in a healthcare facility, a mandatory policy may be more compelling than, uh, say, in a law firm where you have the ability to socially distance, you don't have a lot of public facing interaction. Uh, so you, you wanna be able to articulate the, the really the compelling reason that you, you want to do that. Um, 
you should also bring in key constituents. And if you have organized labor in your, um, in your environment, um, uh, you'll want to bring them into those discussions as well, bring the union in. Um, you want to have an accommodation process, and we're going to talk a little bit more about that shortly. And um, maintain confidentiality is so key of, of uh, employees, of those who are vaccinated or those who've requested um, accommodations. Um, that information is confidential and specific to the employee and should be treated as such. And of course, the um, uh, employer is still going to want to ensure that other COVID safety measures are uh, in place. So some other considerations for a safe return to the workplace. Some additional steps that um, impact safety that employers should consider. I spoke earlier about a multidisciplinary uh, COVID safety team in the organization, um, temperature checks, symptom screening, social distancing, providing safety training to employees when they return about um, what the new expectations may be, recognizing how employees conducted themselves a year ago in the office may not be sustainable right now. And um, those protections need to main, uh, be maintained, um, particularly distancing. Um, you're going to want to uh, consider making sure that you have ample supplies of uh, disinfecting supplies, of um, uh, hand sanitizers, soaps, hand washing um, availability, and if appropriate to your workplace, PPE. Now, again, that may be different for every type of workplace, but um, masks available in the event that somebody forgot theirs or had a you know problem with it during the day, maybe gloves if, if uh, appropriate to certain kinds of workplaces or more intensive PPE, depending on the nature of the job. Um, you could consider um, phased in returns to work, not bringing everybody in because recognize that many employees have been working in solo shops for the last year. They've been based at home and uh, in, in, uh, may not have been having a lot of, of additional um, interaction with individuals. So it may be very um, uncomfortable for them to return to a heavily populated office environment um, uh, after what everyone has gone through in the past year. So phasing in a return to work process uh, may be advisable. Mandatory testing policies. Can employers require that em employees get tested and have a negative test before they can come back to the workplace? or uh, being tested periodically. Well, COVID has been determined to be a direct threat to the workplace. And uh, the EEOC has stated that employers can administer COVID testing so long as the testing is accurate and reliable. And also is mindful, the employer should be mindful of what to do with those test results and how they should be treated confidentially and maintained separately from the employee personnel file. And what about travel restrictions? Well, the CDC is still recommending um, that we avoid travel. So a lot of employers are certainly not requiring that employees travel as a, as a um, uh, aspect of their jobs. However, um, employees still may travel for personal reasons. Um, it, it is um, not advisable, nor would it necessarily even be enforceable for employers to try to prohibit off-time activities, um, it prohibit employees from traveling or vacationing in, in their off time. However, employers can say if employees are going to do that, that they need to quarantine for a period of time after they return from their trip, and or obtain a negative test result before returning to the workplace if they, if they choose to travel. And it's also okay to require employees to use um, their paid time for any kind of quarantining or travel delays um, that result from, from their voluntary decision to travel, recognizing that an employer is going to want to put those policies out there um, so that employees are fully informed as, as to the, you know, the potential conditions or or um, consequences of, of traveling. 
even with all the best precautions in place, you still could have employees who are reluctant to return to the office. So what do you do with those? Well, I think um, uh, EAP options are important at this time to help people manage anxiety, making them available often through your insurance uh, plans. Um, communicating is so key assuring employees about the protections that are in place to reduce infections in the workplace and having good practices and enforcing good practices. Um, certainly before, though, taking disciplinary action um, in terms of perhaps terminating somebody who's refusing to return to work, employers are going to want to make sure that they're refusal is not based on a genuine safety concern that could fall into the protections of OSHA, or that there is some other type of medical or, or um, disability-related consideration that's the basis for um, uh, the employee refusing to come to work or not wanting to return, and that you follow the terms of your existing leave of absence policy. So as I said, we're talking a little bit more about accommodation, the accommodation process. If you have an employee who is requesting an accommodation, most likely a um, uh, additional time to remain working from home. Um, in general, those requests should be funneled to HR and not to supervisors. The reason for that is, um, as I mentioned earlier, that certain information once known can't be unknown. And if in the future, a supervisor needs to take some type of performance-based action uh, against an employer, or in, in, an employee or in relation to an employee, it's better if that supervisor doesn't have any knowledge about the um, uh, specifics of a, either a, a disability-based accommodation or religious-based accommodation. The, the, the supervisor can be neutral on that information. And a supervisor would, would know, perhaps, that an employee has received an accommodation because the employee is not working at the work site, for example. But the particulars of that accommodation, the, the whys behind the accommodation, the supervisor doesn't necessarily need to know that information. And it keeps the supervisor um, um, neutral. Um, so having those requests routed through HR, training the reviewers on the EEOC guidance and what the process is, and as I mentioned, we, there's an interactive process where the employer and the employee need to discuss accommodation proposals and uh, see if, if an agreement can be reached. It should be noted the employer is not required to accept the employee's proposal, they, they, the employer can offer an alternative that accomplishes the same goal, albeit in a way that the employer um, uh, can work with, uh, you know, can, can um, uh, provide, it provides less of a hardship for the employer. So it's not that you just have to, to take exactly what the employee is asking for. But that said, there has to be a, a dialogue, an interactive process. Um, to arrive at, at the um, uh, final accommodation. And I include some examples of, of possible accommodations. Could be a waiver of a particular policy in that employee's uh, individual situation. It could be that instead of working from home, there's a possibility of isolating within the workplace to be in an area where the employee is not really going to be interacting with others remote work could be a continuing uh, accommodation. There could be enhanced PPE or physical barriers that are added to the workplace to accommodate the employee um, or reassignment to a different role where there could be less um, interaction with others or a leave of absence uh, could be a possible accommodation. Um, we talked about um, uh, the um, mandatory vaccines and the exceptions, would, uh, but this would really, these exceptions would apply to any kind of mandatory vaccine, not just COVID. But with a little bit more with regard to religious beliefs and why it's 
they can be challenging when, when there's a, a religious-based accommodation request, because essentially employers must accommodate sincerely held religious beliefs unless the hardship, uh, there's an unreasonable or undue hardship posed by the accommodation. And the standard of whether a religious belief is sincerely held um, is, is not exactly crystal clear. And the EEOC has said that employers should assume that a belief is sincerely held by the employee and examples, unless they act in a, in a way that's in, you know, inconsistent, perhaps. For example, an employer might be doubting the insincerity of an employee's religious belief if their behavior is um, clearly inconsistent with the professed belief, or if the accommodation request seems motivated by other reasons, uh, perhaps um, uh, the the, there is something, there's a particular uh, benefit or the support that the employees uh, provides to, su uh, to support their claim of religious exemption is really more secular in nature. Um, or if the um, request is just kind of the latest uh, swing at bat by the particular employee who asked for an accommodation uh, Previously, but without citing the, their religious beliefs, um, if if it's if they've previously requested an accommodation based on secular reasons, but now it's religious in nature, um, that may be cause for the employer to question um, the sincerity of the religious belief. But that said, you don't need to agree with the religious belief. You don't need to think it's logical, reasonable, or otherwise. But it does need to be. Um, uh, about um, deep and imponderable uh, matters um, and, and part of a, a comprehensive belief system as opposed to just an individualized, I think this is the way the, the world should work um, kind of point of view. It doesn't have to be confined to a traditional or organized religion and it can be, um, uh, a belief can be religious even if it's inconsistent with other aspects of the employee's asserted faith. But it's not social, political, or economic philosophies or, or personal preferences. That won't qualify, those won't qualify as a, as a religious belief. What does undue hardship mean in this context? More than a de minimis cost. So it's easier for the undue hardship um, test or standard to be met for a religious accommodation claim than it can be for um, a disability-based uh, accommodation issue, um, which is based on undue hardship. And documentation, the, the, the kinds of documentation uh, to support a religious request, maybe handwritten um, materials, uh, with a written explanation of, of the nature of the belief and why, maybe some literature from the um, uh, from the religious organization if there's a church involved, uh, perhaps a letter from the clergy um, or a fellow um, uh, congregant um, or somebody uh, who's a third party and just aware of the employee's religious practice or belief. In contrast, the standard for a medical-based or disability-based accommodation, um, the, the documentation is sometimes, uh, it would be uh, a clearer um, than perhaps in a, a religious-based exemption request. Um, unless the medical condition is obvious, it's okay for the employer to request medical documentation. However, um, the request for an accommodation must be granted unless there's an undue hardship, which is defined as a significant difficulty or expense. Um, the last thing I want to talk about is um, mandatory attendance policies um, as a means of um, uh, perhaps disciplining employees who are refusing to come back to work. Uh, employers who went fully or partially remote during the pandemic, um, as we know, may see may get pushback when they ask employees to return to work in person. 
And unless you're in a um, exemption issue or somebody asking for an accommodation, um, uh, you may be in a situation where you're going to need to make a decision about that person, um, whether it's a disciplinary decision or a perhaps a, a separation decision. Um, so when mandating attendance at the workplace, um, consider whether you're going to include within the scope just certain departments, or it's gonna be everybody, an organization-wide return, or a specific position based on job functions where there may be certain job functions that can continue to work remotely, but, but other positions uh, in the employer's view need to be on site. As with any mandatory attendance, and by that I mean mandatory on-site attendance policy, ensure that the employees clearly understand the expectations that the policy is clearly communicated, um, that there are legitimate business reasons behind it, that the employer can articulate why it is important that certain job functions or everybody comes back to the work site. Um, enforcement in a consistent, equitable, and non-discriminatory manner is really important. Um, that you're not having an unattended um, adverse impact on certain individuals or, or classes of individuals within your organization in the manner in which the policy is being enforced. Um, and so that there's not an adverse um, impact on one or more protected groups. And of course, the, with the caveat that application is subject to a reasonable accommodation. Um, uh, obligation if employees are requesting uh, a reasonable accommodation on the basis of disability. An underlying condition that causes an increased risk of severe infection can be an ADA disability, which triggers the reasonable accommodation obligation. Um, and it, but it must be the employee's own condition and not a child or household member um, uh, condition. And fear of exposure alone is not sufficient to trigger an ADA uh, reasonable accommodation obligation. So I hope that uh, these uh, thoughts about returning to work in a safe fashion um, have been helpful and um, would be happy to entertain any questions. Thank you so much, Jennifer. Uh, that was a wonderful presentation, very, very informative. And we do have a few questions here. Is OSHA inspecting or auditing workplaces for COVID-19 safety? Are they coming in? They definitely are. They definitely are. And for people who are interested in some of the details, I uh, recommend that you uh, check out OSHA.gov, uh, OSHA's website and you can get a, uh, a good sense of how they are uh, actively inspecting workplaces. I think uh, um, they have uh, inspected over 300 um, during the pandemic and um, have uh, issued enforcement actions in uh, uh, a lot of those cases uh, with fines exceeding $4 million. So uh, yes, they can inspect and they are doing so. Okay, and so you mentioned fines. Um, so that's one of the things I guess they can do. Um, that's uh, one of the next questions we have here that came in. What can OSHA do if it determines that a workplace is unsafe in terms of COVID protections? Yeah, I mean, I think that the penalties are always a, a, a big deterrent. Um, uh, there are um, uh, other um, Remedies um, available. They can they can bring um, actions. They can um, uh, you know uh, presumably pursue some type of cease and desist process if if need be. But typically, they're the the uh, most common enforcement tool in their in their uh, um, uh, bag of tricks. 
is uh, is is the uh, penalty uh, process, the financial penalty. Okay, and I know that you touched on this in your presentation, but maybe you could um, just reiterate uh, for us. Um, can employers require or mandate employees to get the COVID-19 vaccination? Uh, I'm happy to to chat about that because that that is a you know a complicated issue and um, I I think that the answer is yes with a caveat and um, that is making sure that um, there's a good business reason for mandating uh, vaccination and also being mindful of the emergency use authorization status of the COVID vaccines. Um, but as a general proposition, yes, employers can mandate um, that employees get vaccinated. Okay, and um, one more question. Um, what if an employer actually has a robust safety plan in place and an employee just refuses, just flat out refuses to return to the workplace in person? Like they're, they're interested in working from home, they're fine with that, but they say, no, I'm not coming in. And I think at that point, in in uh, I'm assuming in that in that context, there's no um, medical based reason other than kind of the reason we all share, which is we don't want to get COVID. Uh, but there's no particular um, high risk status of the individual, and they just would they're more comfortable working from home. And I think the um, the quick answer could be, well, there's no basis for that employee, no um, protected basis for that employee to stay home. They don't have a, they're not seeking a medical accommodation. They just don't want to come because they assume they have a, a, a good faith concern for their safety. They just would prefer not to be around a lot of people. At that point, I think an employer could say, well, that's the job I'm offering you, and I want you to be on site. And if you're refusing to be on site, then you are not accepting the employment on the on the terms that I'm offering it. Um, I, so I think that's a quick answer. I don't think that that's necessarily the, the best answer or the best approach without some um, some intervening steps. And I think that includes exploring what the employee's particular concerns are and whether there are ways that those concerns could be accommodated short of staying from home. And that, again, is assuming that the employer has determined as a business um, issue that that employee should be on site and should be returning to site to the site. Um, and uh, assuming that they've made that determination talking to the employee about ways that they can feel better about being there and making sure the employee is fully aware of all the safety um, precautions that the employer has put into place to hopefully alleviate some of that concern. But if at the end of the day, despite all of that, the employer has determined that continuing to work from home is not um, an acceptable option for the employee and the employee is still refusing to return to work, um, at the end of the day, it may be that separation is unavoidable. Okay. Well, I wanted to thank you so much for um, coming on today. Did you have any additional um, advice or things that you might have thought of um, that you haven't mentioned for us today? No, I think that the key is to, uh, for employers, is not to approach these situations, the whole return to work um, uh, um, planning process as a one size fits all or, you know, a uh, rapid, inflexible kind of process. I think most employers are um, going to want to approach the issues carefully, flexibly but most importantly, consistently, treating employees consistently and using a consistent methodology or an analytical approach to evaluating return to work issues. Um, I think everybody's anxious to get um, uh, return to some sense of normalcy, whatever the, the new normal may look like, and to do so as quickly as possible. 
but we are still in a you know, public health emergency and could be for some time. So caution is warranted. Well thought out plans um, are absolutely warranted and, and not just reacting quickly. Wonderful advice. Well, thank you again very much for being here. And um, attendees, please use the contact information on the screens for any additional questions. If you send us any questions, um, uh, if you think of any questions later, we'll, we'll forward them on to Jennifer. Please remember your PACOM and PMI CEU certificate will be emailed to you from within two days following the broadcast. There's no need to request it additionally. You can register for future webinars or request a demo of our compliance solution on our website at firsthcc.com or call us at 888-543-4778. And thank you for joining us.